Hello everyone and welcome to our international policy and research conference. Thank you very much for coming to Paris, to Paris School of Economics. And thank you for those of you who may watch the live stream online. My name is Alice Fauvel. I'm the communications manager at the World Inequality Lab. And today with my colleague, Marc Bumanso, uh, I, we will try our best to guide you through the day. So we have about like 20, 25 speakers and researchers coming from everywhere in Europe and across the world. Uh, will be with us uh, in the next two days. And our first speaker is uh, Gabriel Zuckman, the director of the EU Tax Observatory. So please join me to uh, give a warm welcome to Gabriel Zuckman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. And thanks to all of you for being here. It's such a pleasure to start this wonderful uh, uh, conference. I'd like to thank uh, the many partners, you know, Eurodat, Tax Justice Network, ECRICT, the Global Alliance for Tax Justice, the World Inequality Lab, and of course the EU Tax Observatory. I have the pleasure to serve as director of the observatory. Uh, it's really a, a wonderful two-day uh, event you know, at a crucial juncture uh, where, as many of you know, last year there was a, a historic vote at the UN uh, for uh, starting negotiations on a, UN framework, a new UN framework convention on international taxation, and this could really play a critical role in the future in improving tax progressivity, tax justice globally, and addressing uh, rising income and wealth inequality. And so to start with, uh, for that first uh, keynote, I, I wanted to present the Global Tax Evasion Report 2024 that our observatory released last year to give some of the kind of background uh, perspective and facts about uh, where we stand in terms of the fight against tax evasion globally. And the starting point of this is that, as you know, these issues of international tax evasion have been very high on the policy agenda over the last 10, 15 years. There has been a number of international agreements that have been signed, sometimes you no know, grandiose declarations like, oh, it's the end of, uh, of tax havens. Uh, and so what we wanted to do in that work is more try to kind of assess what's the reality of the progress that's been made uh, based on the data that we can uh, use. And one positive aspect is that there's been an, a, a big increase in data uh, availability and data, uh, new data that have been produced on the profits of multinational companies and the wealth, the offshore wealth of, of very wealthy people. So we wanted to assess kind of what's the reality of the progress and most importantly, what remains to be done. Uh, this is work that, uh, a report that relies on the work of more than 100 researchers globally. You know, about 20 of them are in our uh, observatory, hosted here primarily at the Paris School of Economics. But there is a really a growing, thriving academic community of, uh, of, of researchers working on these issues. And I, I feel very lucky to be, to be part of that community. Um, the data that's used for the report is available online, most of it on the Atlas of the Offshore World. And in, at the very outset, before diving into the results, uh, why, why is it important to uh, write, you know, why do we need a global tax evasion report? And why is a global perspective on these issues really important? It's very important because, you know, too often the, the debate about taxation and inequality is uh, purely in a narrow domestic perspective. But with that perspective, you cannot really uh, understand the issues well. You know, if you take a narrow domestic perspective, it can pay off. Uh, to play the game of tax competition. It can pay off to, uh, to be a tax haven, to offer financial opacity services for the very simple reason, at least in the short run, that this is going to generate some activity, that this is going to generate some tax revenue, this is going to uh, uh, you know, uh, increase uh, the profits uh, that multinational companies are going to book in your country. This is going to uh, increase employment a little bit. And so, you know, from that domestic perspective, it looks like, you know, those policies are a good idea. But of course, all of those policies, low tax rates on multinational firms, you know, financial opacity and so on, from a global perspective, they're really zero sum, or in fact, they're worse than that, they're negative sum. They're zero sum because the activities that move from one country to another, that don't increase the global capital stock uh, in, uh, sorry, uh, thank you, uh, in, in any, uh, in any way, uh, but they are also uh, uh, more fundamentally negative sum because the main beneficiaries of that process 
or uh, rich people, you know, the, uh, uh, the shareholders of multinational companies and the people who can uh, evade taxation. And so those processes of international tax competition, uh, financial opacity and so on, they fuel global inequality. So that's why the global perspective is so important. Okay, so now the results. So the results, it's like in the, in the famous movie that you all know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay, so there's some good news, and I'm going to start with that. The good news is that uh, we've made some progress, uh, some limited progress, but some progress nonetheless, in reducing one very specific form of tax evasion, which is uh, offshore uh, tax evasion by uh, individuals, you know, the concealment of wealth uh, in tax havens. What the graph shows is that there's about 10%, the equivalent of 10% of GDP in offshore wealth globally. You know, that's the blue line. That's the amount of equities and bonds and bank deposits that households own in banks outside of their country of residency, primarily in countries with a tradition, a history of strict bank secrecy. And what the orange line shows is that historically, most of that wealth corresponded to tax evasion because there was a complete bank secrecy in many countries. So it was really child's play for people to earn income offshore, you know, to earn dividends and interest and not report that income in their home country tax authority. But since 2017, 2018, uh, really a, tr a tremendous development, there is an automatic exchange of bank information where uh, banks in more than 100 countries and territories automatically exchange data about the uh, assets and the income of their customers. And look, this has lots of limitations, to be clear. Many countries, especially low-income countries, are excluded from that system. There is uh, clear evidence of non-compliance by a number of financial institutions. Uh, there is quite a lot of wealth that's excluded from that system of information exchange, you know, most importantly, on real estate. At the same time, the data that's emerging uh, from the different tax authorities and the different the body of work you know, uh, at the academic level on these issues suggests that this is making a difference. You know, this is contributing to reducing tax evasion. The magnitudes are very uncertain, to be clear. And in the report, we provide a number of scenarios, but we have to be very careful and very prudent and modest about our ability to precisely quantify that at that stage. But it's clear that the, the, the regulatory environment is different. It's clear that there's also a lot of wealth, you know, about 12 trillion euros in wealth that's held offshore, that's automatically reported each year to a number of tax authorities, and that's wealth that was invisible by those tax authorities uh, five or 10 years ago. So that's real progress. And the point of celebrating that progress is not to say, of course, that that's it, you know, uh, there's no tax evasion anymore and we're living in the best of all possible worlds. That's not true. Uh, that's absolutely not the case. The point is just that this shows ve something very important, which is that tax evasion is not a law of nature. Okay, It's a policy choice. And we've uh, chosen for decades to tolerate this form of tax evasion, rich people hiding their wealth in Switzerland or countries with strict bank secrecy rules. We are making different choices today. And that's very important because it shows that we can make progress in the future. It shows that new forms of international cooperation that were deemed utopian 10, 15 years ago can actually materialize in a short period of time. And I think that's really, uh, that's, uh, really very important. So that's the good. But now, unfortunately, in the time that remains, we must focus on the bad and even the ugly. So the bad is the fact that tax evasion by multinational companies is very much uh, uh, continuing uh, unabated. Uh, this is a picture that shows the uh, loss of corporate tax revenue globally due to the shifting of profits by multinational firms to tax havens. You know, tax evasion by multinational companies, it's you know, when Google for many, many years uh, uh, books hundreds of billions you know, with a B in revenue in Bermuda, uh, where the, the corporate tax rate is a relatively modest tax rate, as you know, of 0%. And they do that for a very long time. And uh, this is happening. It's not just one sector of the economy. It's not just one, uh, one uh, group of firms. No, it's an across the board phenomenon. Uh, and um, uh, it has been uh, growing very fast in, uh, since the turn of the 21st century. In, starting in 2015, there has been a number of policy initiatives, you know, most importantly, the base erosion and profit shifting process, BEPS, by the OECD, then a number of countries like the US that passed tax reforms to try to curb profit shifting by multinationals. But what the graph shows is that despite these efforts, uh, the loss of tax revenue that's, that's due to tax evasion by multinational firms, 
uh, has not declined. You know, it's still about 10%. It doesn't mean that those policies uh, were not effective. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, you can interpret the stabilization uh, of the tax revenue loss as uh, reflecting the causal effect of those policies. You know, maybe absent BEPS or absent uh, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act and similar reforms abroad, maybe the blue line would have kept increasing. Okay, who knows? But what we can say for sure, you know, as a fact, as a matter of fact, is that those policies have not been sufficient to reduce tax evasion by multinational companies significantly. Now, in 2021, there was very high hopes, and I was very excited, when more than 140 countries and territories agreed on a 15% minimum tax for multinational companies. And it's true that it's really a very important development because it's the first time there is an international agreement uh, that puts a floor to how low tax rates can go. It's the first time there's an international agreement on tax rates. We have international agreements about every, lots of things, about free trade, about even about taxation, but all those agreements were silent about the most important aspect of tax policy. The most important aspect is the tax rate. And for the first time, there was an agreement that said, look, multinationals should pay at least 15%. Now, from the very beginning, we could see that this was really insufficient in the sense that 15% is really low and it was already a disappointment given that in 2020, uh, many people felt that you know, tw a rate of 20 or 21% was achievable. In fact, it was in the program of uh, Joe Biden when he ran for, for candidate. Uh, at the beginning of the, the US, the Biden administration, the US was quite uh, 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 vocal in trying to, uh, to, to foster an agreement on the 21% minimum rate, but okay. Countries agreed on 15%, so already, you know, a big disappointment. With a 20% minimum tax rate, what the graph shows is that this would increase global corporate tax revenues by 16.7%. That's the blue line. With the agreed 15% tax rate, that, still, that would still increase global corporate tax revenues by about 9% which, you know, is still something. But then uh, the agreement in 2021 was undermined by a number of loopholes, gradually, and exemptions. All of that, you know, in a very opaque and, and non-democratic manner. And I'm not going to go through all of them, you know, the substance carve-outs, the fact that U.S. multinationals are exempted from some backstop measures for a number of years, the very uh, problematic treatment of tax credits. But the outcome of all of that is today, you know, if we run the whole... Uh, model uh, that we have and we've developed at the EU Tax Observatory, which is, I think, the best, uh, uh, you know, the most uh, detailed uh, model to study these issues. If you run that whole machinery today, we can expect that this 15% minimum tax is going to increase global corporate tax revenues by about 5% only. Okay, so four years ago, we could expect 16%. Today it's 5%. You might say, well, it's better than zero, but it's really totally insufficient. And so it's a major disappointment. However, you know, it's a basis, at least this exists, this minimum tax exists. It has started to be implemented by about 30 countries in 2024. So we can build on that and in the future we can make it better. Okay, but now let me talk about the, uh, the ugly. The ugly points to the fact that we have not started yet to address what's probably the biggest problem in today's tax systems, which is their uh, major uh, regressivity at the top of the distribution. So this is illustrated on this graph that shows on the x-axis the different groups of the distribution. So P010 is the bottom, is the 10% of individuals with the lowest incomes, 10, P1020 is the next 10% and so on. And then you have a zoom you know, uh, at the very top all the way up to dollar billionaires. And on the y-axis, you have their effective tax rates of these different groups of the population, taking into account all taxes paid at all levels of government, you know, including individual income taxes, uh, consumption taxes, wealth taxes when they exist, corporate taxes that are allocated to the shareholders of companies and so on. And so there's a growing body of, of academic work that does this type of computations. Here I'm showing the results for three countries. France is already, unfortunately, at the moment, the, the, the literature is only about, has only results about high tax countries, uh, about high, relatively high income countries, but there's ongoing, very important ongoing work in global South countries. If we focus on these three countries at the moment, France is a relatively high tax country. The overall uh, level of taxation is around 50% of national income. 
at the macroeconomic level. So unsurprisingly, most of the groups of the population pay a lot of tax, uh, 45%, 50%, 55%, except billionaires who pay 25%. All taxes included, including all corporate taxes, they pay through the businesses that they own, only 25% of their income in taxes. Uh, in the US, uh, taxation is, is lower, you know, generally, but there's also a decline in tax rates at the very top, and Netherlands, uh, same pattern of tax uh, regressivity uh, 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 that starts lower in the distribution than in France. So, you know, when people will be looking at that in 20, 30 years, you know, they will all say, look, that's what, that was really a major intellectual and, and political failure. The fact that we tolerate that is really unjustifiable. Of course, we can have a debate about what's the proper level of tax progressivity. And it's a very complicated question. You know, look, it's possible to get it wrong. But I think nobody condones the notion that the individuals with the highest ability to pay taxes should be allowed to pay much less than the rest of the population. That is just unjustifiable. Hence, the main proposal that we formulated in the report, which is to create a, a common, a coordinated minimum tax on the super rich. And look, we know since 2021 that uh, international tax competition is not a law of nature. Uh, we can have agreements on minimum tax rates. And the agreement we have is very imperfect, but at least it exists. And so now let's try to replicate that approach, in, a, in a, but, but much better in practice. But at least those, the overall spirit, the overall approach, let's try to replicate that approach to the very rich. And just like we were able to agree on a minimum tax rate uh, for multinational firms, we should be able to agree on a minimum tax rate, tax rate for the super rich. We made a very concrete, and I want to be clear, very, very modest uh, proposal to start the conversation in that report, which is to have a minimum tax rate uh, on global billionaires, not a big population. You know, you have less than 3,000 billionaires in 2023. And to ensure that those billionaires pay at least in income tax each year, at least 2% of their wealth. Okay, so that's the proposal. Uh, some of them already do, very few of them, but many, many pay little or almost zero income tax. Uh, that was illustrated very vividly, for instance, in, uh, uh, in the U.S. a few years ago with the revelations from the U.S. media ProPublica on the uh, taxes paid by U.S. billionaires, where you see in some years people like Jeff Bezos paying uh, almost zero or zero income tax, Elon Musk paying zero or almost zero income tax. You know, in one year, Bezos reports uh, zero taxable income, and he says, oh, look, I'm so poor. Uh, let me claim family benefits, and he receives family benefits. You know, this is the situation the reality of income taxation today for, for billionaires, uh, in the, uh, not only in the US, but globally. It is very easy when you're very rich to avoid the income tax by structuring your wealth such that this wealth is not going to generate uh, a, a sizable amount or even any taxable income. So many billionaires pay zero. And so what our proposal says is that they should pay at least in income tax the equivalent of 2% of their wealth each year. And you can see that globally, that's where the table, the bottom line shows, it would generate more than $200 billion in additional uh, tax revenue. There are very few billionaires, even though billionaires are very few in number, they have a lot of wealth, 13 trillion, the phenomenon known as wealth inequality. They pay very little income tax. And so forcing them to pay 2% would make uh, uh, really a big difference. Now, you might say, okay, how big is that? 200, let's make it 250 billion if we implemented that tax in 2024. How big is that? I think, you know, one insightful comparison is the following. Uh, according to the best estimates that we have, developing countries need an additional $500 billion in annual government revenue to face the challenges of climate change. And uh, what we say in the report is, look, you can get there with two... Uh, modest uh, global minimum taxes. You know, I want to emphasize these are, these are really, you know, small steps towards a better world, but you have to start somewhere. And, you know, there's a very good case for being obviously much more ambitious uh, than that. But for the short term, I think this should really be the uh, objective uh, in terms of, of making progress. And I think we can't really wait, you know, for 20, 30 years before we start making progress. So it's very important also to have a very practical and concrete and reasonably ambitious short-term agenda for the very simple reason that these inequalities, they really undermine, you know, they threaten to undermine our democratic societies. And there is an urgent need to take uh, action uh, today. 
So two modest proposals. One is a global minimum tax on billionaires equal to 2% of their wealth, 250 billion. Then if you strengthen the minimum tax on multinational firms, make it 20% instead of 15%. You know, most countries, vast majority have a corporate tax rate that's higher than 20%. So 20% would really not be uh, uh, enormous. Uh, and close the loopholes uh, of the existing uh, minimum tax on multinationals, you can uh, raise an additional 250 billion in tax revenue. The good news, and then I'll conclude, is that there is some political momentum actually for these, uh, for these ideas. There is momentum. We see, for instance, that in a number of, of uh, countries, for instance, Brazil has the presidency of the G20 this year, and they want to make those issues, and they are making those issues a priority of their G20 presidency. We see that in some countries, uh, there, in, in all countries, actually, there is enormous popular demand for uh, such proposals. You know, when, they are, uh, when people are polled about these ideas, it's 70%, 80% of people who say they support uh, uh, more taxation on the super rich or higher tax rate on multinational companies. This is one of the, these very rare uh, policy uh, areas where there is overwhelming popular support across party lines. You know, this, this is really uh, uh, very, uh, very rare and very striking. And so uh, uh, we see a number of governments that are already, you know, very modestly trying to take that demand. Uh, into account uh, in some sense. So, for instance, I was struck by the evolution of the debate in the U.S., where, you know, a few years ago, in the previous presidential uh, election uh, campaign, uh, Biden very much campaigned against proposals for wealth taxation that were defended at the time by people like Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren. And then when he was elected, he put in his own budget as president what he calls a billionaire income tax, which is very close in spirit to what I described earlier, you know, the idea that billionaires should pay a minimum amount of tax each and every year. The, the specifics differ a little bit from the very simple proposal that we have in the report that the minimum should be 2% of wealth. But the, the spirit uh, is is very uh, similar, and what's very striking is that he goes on, he goes regularly to talk about that. You know, in his State of the Union address a few days ago, he uh, uh, he mentioned that again. You know, billionaires don't pay their fair share. There has to be a minimum tax on the super rich, and that's really uh, that illustrates how the debate, you know, is is changing. I think in the right direction relatively quickly. Okay, so uh, let me just uh, uh, say, uh, okay, one last thing before I conclude. Uh, let me just say that uh, we are all big fans of international uh, coordination, but uh, there it is important to stress that there is a lot that countries can achieve unilaterally. Okay, and we don't need global agreements uh, to uh, to make progress. There's a lot of progress that can be done. Uh, in the short term by, by countries where there's the political will to address that issues, these issues acting unilaterally. We explained this in the report, and let me just mention one idea, which is the most important one, very concretely. You know, in the debate about taxing the rich, in practice, uh, the debate is always about, okay, we can't do that alone, because if we do it, the rich will, uh, they will move. You know, they will go to Switzerland or to some tax haven, and so we're just powerless. But that view, I want to be very clear, that argument is absolutely incorrect. You know, it's wrong because fundamentally tolerating tax competition is a choice that we make, but we can make other choices. So what we could say, for instance, is we could say, look, if someone has lived a long time in a country, let's say, you know, France, uh, and has become a billionaire in France, and now that person, you know, chooses to move to Switzerland, okay, sure, go ahead, but France is going to keep taxing you after you've left for a number of years, you know, we can discuss five, 10, 15 years. Today, what we're doing, what all countries essentially, almost all countries are doing is they're saying, look, if you've lived a very long time in our country, now you move abroad to a tax haven, immediately starting January 1st of next year, we stop taxing you. That's the choice that we currently make, but it's absurd. You know, what I described would be much more meaningful if you've become very rich in a country, you know, that's obviously because you've benefited from, in part, from public infrastructure, from education, from healthcare, uh, uh, and uh, there's just no natural right uh, to, uh, once you've become rich, you know, uh, move abroad and have no tax to pay anymore. You know, it would be perfectly legitimate for countries uh, to keep taxing you after your departure. And that's important because, you know, this idea is important because it really vividly illustrates that there is a whole 
uh, range of policies that can be implemented uh, unilaterally for in, in countries that want to make progress on, on you know, improving tax progressivity. Okay, so let me conclude by saying that most important, tax evasion is not a law of nature, it's a policy choice. Some policies have been somewhat effective, others are falling short, and yet some issues like the taxation of the very rich remain uh, wholly unaddressed. And you know, the second big idea is that uh, the ideal is international coordination, but there's also a lot that can be uh, achieved unilaterally, and, and we think this is really key to change the dynamic of global tax competition and reconcile globalization with tax justice. Thank you so much.